Hi folks, I'm here in a script that we've seen before in class called saratogahouses.r and the goal of this walkthrough is to orient you to what's called the regression table or sometimes the regression summary table. Uh, the regression table has a lot of information and we're going to kind of walk through it piece by piece so you can understand what kinds of questions it's answering and why those questions might be important or interesting for a given data set at hand. So let me come back up here to the top of saratogahouses.r. Uh, we're not going to go anywhere near throughout this entire script, but I will get my libraries queued up and I will load the data set on house prices from Saratoga, New York. That's one that comes pre-distributed as part of the Mosaic package. So the only need, thing you need to do to load it is to click the data command right here. Okay. Uh, I'll also filter those houses uh, that have a lot size of zero. There's only two of them, but it's sort of hard to understand what's going on there. Now, the question that we tried to answer in class was how much is a fireplace worth? And one of our first cracks at that question uh, was down here on line 40, where we built a multiple regression model with price as an outcome, and then two size variables in the model to adjust statistically for the uh, simultaneous effect of size and fireplaces on price. So we've got living area, the size of the house in square feet, lot size, the house, the size of the, the house's lot in acres, and then the number of fireplaces that are in that house. So this is a familiar model uh, from class. Let's go ahead and fit this model, and then I'm going to type something new down here. This actually isn't in the original script, but it's just one command, and it is summary. So I'll call this summary of LM1. I'll just type that directly into the console down here. And what we get, this is the regression table right here, okay? And uh, we're going to spend some time orienting you to the different pieces uh, of this regression table. Uh, briefly, there are four overall pieces of information. Uh, there's the estimates of the coefficients themselves. There's some measure of the uncertainty of those coefficients. There's some information about the overall predictive uh, efficiency or predictive abilities of this model, and then there is some information about statistical significance of each of these individual effects that are in the model. So uh, let's just go piece by piece here. So first of all, the coefficients themselves, and this is exactly the same information that we could have gotten from, say, the coef command. So up here on line 41, if you see me execute coef, and then you compare that with this column of the regression table called estimate, you notice it's the same numbers. There's the estimated intercept, there's the estimated slope, partial slope on living area, lot size, and fireplaces right there. Okay, so that's just replicating information in tabular form that we've already got. That's simple enough. All right, uh, let's talk about the second piece of information that are tabled. There's a little bit of information about the overall fit of the model, and that occurs in two places. First of all, it occurs right down here in this line where we see multiple R squared. So here R squared is about 51, 52%. Now, uh, somewhat confusingly, R also gives you this uh, thing called adjusted R squared. We're not going to talk too much about what that's trying to do. Um, we're just going to go with a multiple R squared. Kind of briefly, what this is trying to do is do some kind of adjustment for the number of different predictors that are in the model, uh, but it's doing so in a way that, uh, you know, frankly, we have better tools nowadays, and we're going to learn some of them later in the class. So we're just going to focus on this measure in sample of how much variation in the outcome these predictors were capable together of predicting. It was about 51, 52%. The second piece of information about model fit is down here, what's called the residual standard error. And this has a actually another name. It's sometimes called the root mean squared error. That's root as in square root, mean squared error. Uh, the intuition here of this residual standard error is what is the average error this makes in dollars on a particular house in this data set? So in other words, if we were to come over here uh, and kind of look, well, this is just living area, right? So this is only one variable, but the intuition here is how far away are the points on average from the predictions made by the model? And the answer is about $68,000. So the, the number here is, is has a unit associated with it, unlike R squared. So R squared is a unit-free measure of model fit. What overall proportion of variation and why does the model predict? And the residual standard error, also called the root mean squared error, or RMSE, is a uh, quantity that measures the quality of the fit in units of the outcome variable. So here it's dollars. So again, the interpretation of that number, the average predictive error made by this model on our data set is about $68,000. That's how much we get house prices wrong by when we use this model to predict at least on average. Okay, so those are pieces that we've kind of seen before, fairly straightforward to interpret. 
Uh, the next question that we want to answer here is, what about uncertainty associated with the, the variables? And that's where this column of standard error comes in. Now, uh, loosely speaking, the standard error is a measure of how far off we expect these estimates to be compared to the values for the full population. So this is just a sample, right? So let's, let's take this parameter on living area. We've estimated on the basis of this sample of houses from the Saratoga area to be about $107, $108 per square foot, holding these other two features constant, lot size and number of fireplaces. This standard error is saying, well, how far off do I expect this estimate from my sample to be in generalizing to the population? And we're saying, well, we think it's probably off by something like three units. This is, uh, it's a very confusing piece of terminology because this is closely related to the idea of like a margin of error from a political poll. Usually the margin of error is more like twice the standard error. So we're not gonna get into the details of the terminology here. Just think of this as about the size of error that this number is making when we are estimating the corresponding population parameter. If you want to get technical, the standard error, what it really is, is the standard deviation of this estimate's sampling distribution. If we were to take repeated samples over and over and over again and make a histogram of those uh, slopes that we got on the living area coefficient for all of those different samples, well, the standard deviation of that histogram would be about three. That's the standard error. Okay, so this is giving you a measure of uncertainty. Let's take the lot size coefficient. For this sample, we've estimated a premium for an additional acre of land holding uh, living area constant, holding fireplaces constant to be about $6,300. But there's a lot of uncertainty there, right? Because the standard error, the uh, magnitude of error that we think this number represents as estimate of the population is about $2,300. So again, in loose terms, that's about how far off we think this number is uh, plausibly is from the population. Of course, we don't know which direction, uh, but that's that's about our best guess for the, the size of the likely or probable error. And ditto for the fireplace coefficient. All right, so that's the standard error column. The second column that's right next to the standard error is called t-value or t-statistic. Uh, this is a term that gets used all the time, especially in introductory statistics classes. Uh, I'm not gonna lie to you, I find the t-statistic um, a lot less valuable than either this column or this column together. This column has units, right? It's the, uh, the change in the outcome, change in dollars per every additional square foot, change in dollars for every additional fireplace. Likewise, this column has units. We think that our estimate for the, the uh, premium of one additional fireplace is about $8,800, but we might be off by something like $3,300 either way. This quantity here, the t-statistic, is literally just the ratio of this number to this number, okay? And that's row by row, right? So this t-statistic right here is the ratio of this number to this number. And so first thing, let's just verify that that indeed is exactly what these numbers represent. Let's take the living area coefficient right here, 107.671. Let's divide that by the standard error, the standard deviation of that estimator sampling distribution. Lo and behold, we get a number 35.59, 35.59. So this number, let's check one more time, just as a quick sanity check. Let's calculate the t-statistic by hand for the lot size coefficient. So the estimate is about 63.72. The standard error is about 23.71. Oops, I need to divide his side in there. And we get 2.68, 2.687. Bingo. Okay, so that's literally all this column represents. And as you can see, uh, it, it's strictly speaking redundant. If you know this and you know this column, you automatically know the t-statistic because it's just this thing divided by this thing. Uh, the kind of natural question is, okay, so why is this redundant thing promoted to the level of something that appears in the regression table? And there's kind of a couple of answers to that. One, honestly, is largely historical reasons before there were fast computers to be able to do things like bootstrapping. Uh, the uncertainty quantification associated with regression models relied heavily on the theory behind this column. And we're not going to get too much into those details because, frankly, we've got faster computers and better tools for doing these things than they had in, say, 1930. Um, the other reason that you might care about this t-value is because you can interpret it as a signal-to-noise ratio. Um, roughly speaking, it is telling you how big this number is relative to the uncertainty, right? So, for example, this t-statistic of about 36, this is telling you that the estimate of 107 is quite large relative to the uncertainty of that estimate, 107 divided by 3, it's like 36 right there. Uh, whereas this number right here, even though it's a larger number in absolute value than the living area coefficient, 
um, it is smaller relative to its uncertainty. So if you think about this is the signal, the underlying thing that you're trying to estimate, and this is the noise, the uncertainty you have in estimating that quantity for the population, the T statistic or the T value can be thought of as like a signal to noise ratio. So if you kind of scan down this column, this is giving you a, a rough one number summary of how precisely these coefficients are estimated relative to their magnitude. Higher T statistics indicate whether positive or negative, right? So if this coefficient is negative, the T statistic is going to be negative too. So you should really think about it in terms of its absolute magnitude. T statistics that are higher in absolute magnitude reflect uh, parameters that are more precisely estimated relative to their magnitude. Okay? And it's a unitless quantity, uh, which makes it a little bit more difficult to interpret. There's no units, there's no y or x associated with this. All right, so these two columns, standard error and t-value, are giving you some information about the uncertainty associated with your estimates. This is an absolute measure of uncertainty or precision. This is a relative measure of precision, uh, where uh, it's kind of awkward, right? L higher numbers here mean less precision. Higher numbers here mean more precision, that you've estimated your coefficient more precisely uh, relative to its, uh, its level of uncertainty in this column right here. Okay, uh, that, so we've covered three things here. We've covered the coefficient estimates. We've covered the summaries of model fit down here on the R squared line and this residual standard error line right here. And then we've covered the idea of uncertainty from this regression table, the standard error and t-value uh, columns. The last thing that this table includes is some information about statistical significance. Okay, and that's this last column over here, which is abbreviated, um, you know, somewhat confusingly, probability greater than absolute value of t. This, in other words, is a p-value. And specifically, these numbers here represent p-values under the null hypothesis that this coefficient over here for the wider population is identically zero. Now, of course, this coefficient is not identically zero for our sample. I mean, just look at it. It's 14,282. Or maybe a more useful one is this one, the living area coefficient, or this one, the lot size coefficient. Let's take that one, right? So let's take that p-value of 0 0.00729. That p-value is calculated under the null hypothesis that this coefficient, not in the sample, but in the wider population of houses in the Saratoga area, is identically zero. So if you think about what that null hypothesis represents, it represents a partial effect of nothing. In other words, once we've adjusted for a living area and the number of fireplaces, the partial slope on lot size is identically zero. Well, that doesn't look very plausible in light of this p-value, right? This p-value is saying, well, if the true partial slope on lot size, holding living area and fireplaces constant, were actually zero, the probability of getting a coefficient at least this big in our sample is quite small, less than 1%. So these numbers over here are giving a one number summary of the statistical significance of the numbers over here in this column. And uh, there are a lot of mathematical details about how these p-values are computed. And quite frankly, those technical details are useful if you intend to be a math major or a PhD in statistics or computer science, and they are not all that useful from the perspective of interpreting what these numbers mean. And the reason I say that is because these numbers over here are very easy to overemphasize. And my advice would be, yes, it's interesting to take a look and ask, well, what level of evidence in the data is there for supporting or rejecting the idea that the corresponding coefficient over here in the wider population is exactly zero, but that is not nearly as useful as producing a confidence interval or some measure of uncertainty anchored like in this standard error over here. So these p-values are producing some information, but that information is very nearly redundant with the confidence interval for this corresponding coefficient, which we've got via bootstrapping or via approximate confidence intervals that rely on some probabilistic assumptions about the model errors. And uh, we can always ask, well, what is, uh, what is the plausible range of effect sizes and is zero in that range of effect sizes? And the answer to that question is, is more or less telling us the same kind of information as what this p-value column is telling you over here. Nonetheless, because historically people have focused a lot on p-values for regression coefficients, it's featured very prominently in R's summary table and in the summary regression tables for most package software. So 
Uh, again, this is these are p-values. They assume that the corresponding coefficient is zero, and that's the null hypothesis, and ask, well, how likely is it that we'd see coefficients at least this big if those null hypotheses were true? And for each of these terms, the answer is not likely. And you may say, what's that about? Well, that, that p-value is actually less than 2 times 10 to the minus 16th, that scientific notation there, uh, which is to say uh, so small that further precision is essentially redundant. And these little stars over here are a bit silly. Uh, there's a little scale for those uh, codes right here. So for example, three stars tells you that the p-value is between 0 and 0 0.001 two stars between 0 0.001 and 0 0.01 and so forth. Uh, and I um, wouldn't put too much stock in these stars over here. Honestly, the practice of staring at a regression table and only looking for the stars to see which coefficients have stars besi uh, beside them is given the fairly derogatory name among data scientists of stargazing, uh, for, you know, which it's roughly uh, considered uh, you know, kind of synonymous with astrology on some levels. Okay, so uh, I, I would, if, if we're kind of picking things to emphasize here, these two columns, estimate and standard error, or kind of similarly the confidence intervals, are the really, really important things. Uh, these uh, bits about model fit, like the multiple R squared, the unit free measure of model fit, and the residual standard error, how much, uh, how, what's the size of error that our model makes in units of the outcome variable are definitely the most important pieces. Things like the t-statistic and the p-value are useful for some purposes, not generally as useful or as interesting as the actual effect sizes and their corresponding confidence intervals. Now, there's, we've given you a walkthrough guide to this uh, just in paper, right? A PDF that, that has this uh, information uh, similarly in it. And there's a few extraneous bits of that table that we're not really going to use. Uh, so things like this column down here and uh, a few other bits over here that are not that, uh, not that important, the adjusted R squared. So if you want to kind of see what those are, are doing, uh, go take a look at that PDF. Uh, but for now, that covers the regression summary table. Anytime you've got a fitted model like LM1 up here on line 40, if you just pass it to the summary function, you will get this table. And now you know how to interpret every last bit of it.